Welcome, Window to China. I'm your host, Xin Yu Zhang. I'm so welcome. Mr. William Conton is a, an American politician who represents District 47 in the New York Assembly. Welcome. Can you introduce yourself? I am very happy to be here and honored to be here. Uh, my name is William Colton, and I am the State Assembly Member for the 47th District, which is in the southern part of Brooklyn, New York. And my district has about 140,000 uh, persons, and it has is a very diverse district. People coming from China, from Russia, from South America, as well as many people who have been in this country many years. So this is a district of immigrants, uh, and it's always been that since the 1900s. It's very diverse, the population. Also, it's Susan Guan, it's a, a side of the Mr. Cottons. So welcome, Susan, can you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Susan Zhuang. I'm Assemblyman Cotton's chief of staff. I have been working for him for two years. And I, uh, I heard he, that you said Mr. Cotton is very supportive. Can you give uh, him a little bit of remark? Yes, uh, he always works with the community people. We have 5,000 people come to our office every year. We help people with um, food stamp issue, help them have housing issue, different kind of issue. Any issue you could imagine, we will help them. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Also, I'm so uh, thankful for your uh, support as a police officer, Mr. Uh, Peter Liang's case. Can you talk about a little bit why you support this case? Yes, this is a very tragic situation. We have great sympathy for the family of Akai Gurley, who was the person who was shot in that totally dark hallway, as we have great sympathy for the family of police officer Peter Liang, who have gone through tremendous anguish. What happened in this situation was we had police officer Liang who was on the force for less than two years, and he was paired with his partner, who also was on the force for less than two years. And these two rookie police officers were assigned to patrol a dangerous hallway inside a public housing building. And when they went into this hallway, the stairwell lights were totally out. It was totally dark. So they proceeded with police officer uh, Liang with a gun in his left hand because it was a dangerous area and just that previous week a shooting had taken place in that very building and he had a flashlight in his other hand and they were patrolling this stairway leading up towards the roof and in each floor they were instructed to open the door so they could look in the lobby hallway of the building and see if there was anything inappropriate or dangerous going on so it, the testimony is that when he got to the eighth floor, he pushed the door open with his shoulder because he had his gun drawn in one hand and his flashlight in the other hand. And when he pushed the door open, there was a loud noise, was startled, and this revolver went off. It actually did not hit anybody directly. It actually hit the wall in the stairwell. And it unfortunately and tragically ricocheted off the wall and hit somebody who was also in the stairway 
apparently because the elevators in the building were not working. And this was completely, everybody agrees, it was an accident, an accidental discharge. And yet, despite that fact, this police officer Liang was charged with manslaughter, with intentionally shooting somebody even though everybody agrees that the, it was an accidental discharge, bullet did not hit the person directly, it hit the wall, and it then ricocheted off to, into someone's heart, and that resulted in this terrible tragedy. So why do you think the conviction, conviction like this? What's wrong I, with that? I think what happened here was that during the past year, we have had a terribly anti-police sentiment in New York City. Uh, there have been four police officers who have actually been killed. One of them was a police officer who was a constituent in my own district, and his family is still mourning and grieving over his loss. There was a, a, there is a terrible amount of anti-police sentiment, and I think this influenced the, the context in which the trial took place. Uh, there were demonstrations going on, uh, my understanding is that while the jury was getting its instructions from the judge and, and was getting ready to deliberate this case, the, the demonstrators were demonstrating and their voices actually could be heard by the jury. There was this, this climate whereby there was a fear that there might be violence or riots if the verdict did not go the way, you know, people wanted it to go. And unfortunately, what happened was that the district, the prosecuting attorney who had admitted all along that this was an accidental discharge, and but in his closing statements, and the witnesses had testified to that, all the witnesses agreed he did not aim his gun at the victim and shoot him, that, that he was startled by a sound, he had a reflect action, a reaction to it, and the result was the gun went off. But in his closing statement to the jury, the prosecuting attorney changed the whole story and he said to the jury that the defendant turned around, pointed his gun at the victim and deliberately pulled the trigger. There was no testimony to back that up, no evidence to back that up. And in fact, it was exactly opposite to the argument that the prosecuting attorney had been making all along. But unfortunately, I think it confused the jury and it, it put additional pressure on them uh, because in a closing statement, there's no opportunity to present any contradictory evidence to rebut what his statement was. And unfortunately, I think that may have confused the jury. Uh, the prosecuting attorney also had the jury feel the weapon, the gun. And of course, when you have a re startled reaction, you know, if you had a glass of, of water and you, you have a startle reaction, you might crush that glass of water. But just squeezing it will not be the same as when you're startled and you crush it. And I think that that confused the jury, and that's why I think, unfortunately, there is a very unjust verdict in this case. I think it is such a tragedy. It's not good for two families. Also, I mean, how do you think this, um, this time the Chinese community will do protest. Do you think it will cause the problem between the Chinese community and American community? You know, in the years that I have represented the people in this neighborhood, mm -hmm. I've always had the philosophy that you focus on the things in common, the common concerns, the common values. And when you do that, people will work together to come up with a solution to improve it. Now, in this particular terrible tragedy, there are a lot of causes for what happened. A lot of causes that are much more direct than, than blaming police officer Liang. Window to China offers insight to Chinese traditions to the viewers of Fairfax Public Access with a focus on education, politics, and development. Interviews with prominent figures such as politicians, artists, and local leaders on the program are conducted in the hopes of broadening the culture gap between China and other foreign cultures.
there was a second officer who was with police officer Liang, and he actually was given immunity by the district attorney not to prosecute him criminally uh, in return for his promise to testify. And uh, that may be the reason why he, you know, testified. But the question is, you know, if they're saying that something was not done, both officers were there. And if, if you know, the gun should not have been drawn, and I can't imagine that because you're in a dark stairway. I mean, you know, clearly an officer has a right to draw his gun when he feels threatened. And here was a darkened stairway, which had actually shooting had occurred there just recently in the, in the last, within the last month. And it was totally dark. And so the officer had felt that he to draw his gun and the gun accidentally discharged. And the other officer did testify on behalf of the prosecution. And that's what he testified to, that it was an accident, that they were both patrolling the stairway. And all of a sudden, the gun discharged. And they didn't know what happened. They didn't even know that the bullet had hit somebody. Because the victim ran downstairs bleeding with a bullet in him. And it was only two flights later that they discovered when they went down to see, you know, what the damage was, that they discovered that there was even someone hit. So, you know, there's no explanation. In fact, the other officer has now been fired. A day after the trial, the other officer was fired. Uh, but this was an accident. And, you know, bringing the action against the criminal action against one officer and not the other, there's no explanation. And there's no, no real explanation as to why when you have an accident, the district attorney chose to proceed with it as a felony, as a manslaughter case. And there's no explanation as to why when everyone at the trial testified that there was an accidental shooting, that it wasn't aimed at the victim, they couldn't see the victim, they didn't even know the victim was there, why the district prosecuting attorney in his closing statement would tell the, grand ju tell the jury that the, the defendant pointed, he turned, pointed his gun at the victim and deliberately pulled the trigger. That was not true. It was not based upon any evidence. And, and really, the court should not have allowed that, that kind of instruction to go to the jury. Yeah, I think his argument to just say, because after the tragedy, they didn't rescue the you know, victims timely you know, is the past four minutes. But I think both the officer on site, I uh, was on site. So if they have a responsibility, they should, both of them should have. Um, anyway, uh, do you think any way this case could be changed around? Yes. Before a certain time? Yes, the, under the legal procedures, there are a number of rights that the defendant has. First of all, the next step is he is going to make, his attorney is going to make a motion to the judge to set aside the verdict on the basis that the prosecutor was incorrect in telling the jury that the defendant turned around, that police officer Lang turned around, pointed his gun at a victim, and pulled the trigger deliberately. That simply is not based upon any evidence, and the prosecuting attorney should not have told that to the jury. Uh, there's also other mistakes that I believe might have been made, and so the judge has a right to, to answer or to respond to a motion of the defendant that the case, the verdict should be set aside based upon errors and mistakes that occurred during the trial. Secondly, there's going to be the issue of sentencing. The judge could sentence the officer to up to 15 years in jail, but he could also sentence the officer to probation. And so there's now, you know, letters being written by the community are urging the judge in this case, because really both the Akai Gurley, who was killed, and police officer Liang are both victims of the system, of a system which allowed, you know, an unlit hallway that these officers, as well as the tenants of the building and the staff of the building, were forced to go through for months. This didn't just happen. The hallway was darkened for months. Nothing was done to repair it. And, and that should not have been. That's the responsibility of the city. 
uh, the responsibility of the police force in not putting two rookie officers together. These are two rookie, and in fact, right after the trial, the city police department issued a policy statement that they will no longer put two police, two rookie police officers together in such a dangerous situation. So these are causes to this terrible tragedy that are outside of the officer Peter Liang. And I think the court needs to consider it. And also the anti-police climate. I'm wearing right now a blue ribbon. Mm. And that blue ribbon I've been wearing since December of 2015, when police officer Wen John Lu, another Asian police officer, was killed in the line of duty, together with his partner, Detective Rafael uh, Ramos. They were sitting in a police car after a week or so after there had been very violent disturbances and demonstrations uh, over the death of another civilian in a Staten Island case where a police officer was basically had tried to arrest somebody. He, he jumped up and he grabbed the person by the throat, put a, what appeared to be a chokehold, and the person died. And that police officer, there was no indictment. And so people were very angry and it created an anti-police climate that I believe influenced the jury in terms of its dealings with police officer Peter Liang, where there was truly an accident. There is no evidence that he knew that he was firing the gun, that he saw the victim or even knew the victim or even knew the victim was there. This was an accidental discharge. And under our law, an accident should not be a felony. And, and, and that is the climate, however, that this jury was forced to be in. There were anti-police statements and demonstrations going on. And the system was almost looking to find, to indict a police officer, whether he was guilty or not, because there was a cry that somehow police officers, if, if someone is killed, they should be indicted. There should be revenge taken. There should be an indictment and a penalty. And that was the climate that this trial took place in. So we have been trying to promote support for the police department. And that blue ribbon we've been wearing to show our support for New York City police officers who risk their lives every day, go through all kinds of dangers, all kinds of uh, terrible situations to protect us, to protect the families of New York City. And police officer Liang was in that darkened stairway, that dangerous stairway, to try to protect the people in that building from the criminals that were dwelling in that stairway, that were hiding in there, doing drugs, shooting, doing all kinds of terrible things. That's why police officer Liang went in there. It was not his intention to harm anyone or kill anyone. It was the accidental discharge of his gun that, that occurred in a situation where he should never have been placed with a rookie police officer as a partner in a stairway that had no lights and where there was somebody in that stairway because they too were had to use it in order to go from one floor of the building to another in darkness in a darkened area so you know that's what we feel the injustice is both police officer liang and akai Gurley are victims of the system of a system that did not work to protect the families of new york city and, and the result is we have this terrible tragedy where two families are being destroyed because of the failure of government to do what it should have done to protect the families of the city. Why do you think as anti-police uh, sentiment is growing bigger? Do you think they like a communication with the community? Or why is nationally grow bigger? I think there's a couple of things that have been going on. First of all, there have been few instances of police officers who have done things that are wrong. And that creates a anti-police sentiment. But we should not blame the 99% of the police officers who didn't do anything wrong mm. for the small 1% or so. There's always some bad apples in any career, in any group, in any job category. So that's one thing. But the second thing I think is, that there's been a tendency by certain people, certain organizations, even certain politicians, to, to stir up that anger for their own benefit. 
And some of the statements that have been made after the incidents that have occurred have been very inflammatory. They haven't highlighted the fact that there was maybe a specific police officer who was engaged in some kind of a wrongful act. And that police officer, yes, should have been prosecuted. That police officer should have been disciplined. But that doesn't mean that all police officers are bad. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, focusing on, you know, attacks against the police in general, instead of focusing on an individual person who might have violated their oath of duty, I think has stirred up this anti-police climate. And of course, you know, the newspapers do publicize it. And, and of course, there's always one group that always will be against the police, and that is the people who want to break the law, because the police are always stopping them from breaking the law. And it confuses the great majority of people when they hear, you know, this kind of inflammatory language, when they see a terrible, you know, evil that has been done, uh, an innocent person who has been killed or seriously injured, but, you know, our system does not focus on the person who committed that outrage. Instead, they seem to focus on attacking the police in general. And I think that is part of our problem. Yeah, I understand. I think most of the officers uh, serve this country dedicationally. Uh, it's great. Also, I think it should be away with the politics. This is the people and personal. I mean, Mr. Liang's... Uh, my mother is really was very sad about the, his son's tragedy. So, have you heard about that? His, his mom's yes. News? Yeah, I've seen the mother, you know, quite a bit in the last few weeks. Uh, I, for example, she related the story that Peter Liang wanted to be a police officer since he was five years old. Oh. When he was five years old, he said, I want to be a police officer. And, and finally, two years ago, he became a police officer. He had to quit his job with Homeland Security. He'd been working for Homeland Security. And he quit that job to take the job as a New York City police officer. So, you know, this is a terrible tragedy, you know, where you have somebody who basically wanted to be in law enforcement because he wanted to help people, because he wanted to protect people. And yet, you know, what has now happened is he has been made a victim of a system by being convicted as a murderer, a guilty of manslaughter, when in fact a terrible accident happened that he did not intend and that I don't believe he really had culpability in doing. You know, there was a question, and it is interesting because there was a question, why did he administer CPR? He, he and, and, and it was cooperated by the other officer, that they did not have proper training. They were on the, the dummy in CPR training at the police academy for less than two minutes. And he was concerned. Now, I think obviously one of the things here is that when someone gets shot in the chest, I'm not so sure, you, have, you know, there has to be a, a decision made. Will CPR help or not help? Mm. You know, because if you're compressing the part where the bullet has hit, I'm not so sure CPR is the best way to go. He, you know, he called it in. There was some delay because he didn't know that the victim had actually been shot until some time afterwards. Mm. You have to understand, the dark hallway, a shot went off. They were both startled. Both of the officers had to go to the hospital because there was injury to their ear. They had trouble hearing after the, the shot went off because when a shot goes off in a closed space, it reverberates into a tremendous noise that, that bangs against, that, that strikes against their eardrums. So, you know, it could be understandable, the shock and the trauma that they experienced, why they might have hesitated or not been able to think clearly, you know. But the result is that 911 was called. There was an ambulance there within a number of minutes. And the two officers were not, did not in any way delay or inhibit help from getting there. Uh, and whether they should have administered CPR, I think that's a judgment call that has to be made. Uh, but, you know, they, they basically did what they could do and, you know, under the circumstances, they themselves were traumatized by this whole incident. Also, I think the audience ha have uh, the one question. Why is the whole case um, during the jury, uh, I mean, Officer Liang has no any explanation why 
he hasn't have any intention. Why he didn't say anything? I think he did testify in the case, and he did say that it was an accident, that he did not deliberately pull the trigger. He oh. testified that his finger was alongside the trigger, and that when that noise occurred, he was startled and he had a reflex reaction. Also, I have spoken to some people who have knowledge of guns, and they tell me that that particular gun that he was carrying, the Glock, right, is a gun that is known for misfiring. If it's dropped, for example, it can go off. And, and here is a situation where he's got the gun in one hand, a flashlight in another. He hits the, the door in order to open the door so we can see what's going on in the hallway. And at that time, the gun fired off. So, you know, this, is, this was an accident. There is no testimony whatsoever from anyone, not from the, the girlfriend of the victim, nor from the other police officer, nor from Detective Liang, that he turned and saw someone and fired at that person. There is no testimony whatsoever. This was completely an accident, and there's no way it's justified that he should be convicted of manslaughter under the circumstances of an accident. Got you. So I heard about, I just learned from uh, morning news. Actually, the second officer today said he did something, he said something wrong. He grabbed, uh, you know, Officer Liang's uh, phone when, he, after the tragedy, so Officer Liang will call 911, but the second officer grabbed the phone, say you don't call it. So I, I'm not sure this news is true or not, but I just learned in the morning. So I hopefully uh, this case can turn around because that's both tragedy for two families. So what that's do you think is the solution we can uh, condense it to for two? We can do something for both family. What do you think? Well, I think that certainly is something that, you know, we can and should do because we certainly have great sympathy for both families. Mm -hmm. And we want to bring some closure to this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what, what is needed here when you have a terrible tragedy like this is, is justice but not revenge. You know, if, because one family has suffered a terrible loss, that does not make it right to have a second family also suffer a terrible loss. Two injustices is will never create justice. We have to make changes in the system that put that officer, the rookie partner, in a totally dark stairway, and that put Akai Early, the victim, in a totally dark stairway where this accident occurred. We need to make changes in the kind of rhetoric that people have, seeking instead of dividing people and, and rhetoric that inflames people, Rhetoric that focuses on what improvements are needed in a community, in a government system, a housing system that was basically responsible for maintaining the building, in the police department that was responsible for the training and the policy on which those officers operate. We need to make those kinds of changes by working together because that's what brings us in common. We have a common desire to have a police force that is well-trained and professional, and to have a, a system in place where criminals will be strictly you know, arrested and will go to jail if, in fact, they break the law, and that people can feel safe in their buildings. And we should not have broken elevators and, and broken lights in stairways of city-owned buildings, in any buildings, in fact. But where it's a city-owned building, and the city government has a particular responsibility not to allow that to occur. And as I said, this, these lights were out, not for a day, not, not for hours, not for a day, but for months, there were complaints that these lights were out. And, and yet, they were not, in fact, that hall it was not lit up. And so you had to have police officers and tenants and staff walking in a docking hallway where criminal activity had been demonstrated to have been going on. And, and that's the tragedy. And the solution to that is people coming together and demanding that those conditions be corrected so we all can enjoy security, 
and well-being and safety for ourselves and for all of our family. Great. Thank you so much for being here today. So you, I know you are very busy too. So also I want to thank you for your uh, service for all the communities, not for particular communities. I mean, especially Chinese community really get a, a lot of support from you. Thank you so much.